guys! Today I want to talk with you about The Empire of Storms, a fantasy adventure novel by Sarah J. Maas. Empire of Storms was published in 2016 and it is the fifth book in the Throne of Glass series, as well as it is the first book in the series that is not considered to be an appropriate read for young adult audience. Though in my personal opinion, the book doesn't include anything so explicit that a 16-year-old could not read about. So as per usual, we will start this review with a short synopsis, and then proceed into the non-spoiler review and wrap this video up with the spoilers. If you want to catch up on the previous installments of this series, make sure to check out my previous videos for The Throne of Glass. And if you haven't read this book yet, then do not worry, I will make sure to let you know when the spoilers begin. However, I do need you to keep in mind that this whole video will include spoilers from Throne of Glass, Crown of Midnight, Heir of Fire, and Queen of Shadows. You have been warned. With the upcoming war pushing right at their doorsteps, with King of Otherland dead, and with Aelin out in the open, Empire of Storms tells us a story of the last preparations for the inevitable battle. Aelin and her court travels to Terrasen with the intention of claiming back her throne, while Dorian stays behind in Rifthold trying to figure out the extent of the mess that his father left behind. With the allegiances more or less clear, our heroes need to figure out how to convince other to fight for their cause, how to send Erevan back to his world, how to kill Maeve, and how to win an unwinnable war. Now I have to admit that I have a bit of a love-hate relationship when it comes to the Empire of Storms. This is not my favorite book in the series, but at the same time it had some of my favorite scenes of the whole series. Most of this book deals with war plans and never-ending battles, and while the action sequences more often than not are interesting and very well written, my favorite thing about this series have always been the characters and their interactions. And with so much action uh, waiting for us, the character development seemed to have slipped into the back seat this time around. Now don't get me wrong, we still get quite a lot of witty dialogue and romance, as well as we get to see some of the characters passing important life milestones and learning to understand themselves better or finding their actual place in this life. We get to learn much more about Lorcan and Elite as individuals, we get to follow Manon on a journey she has never been on before, and we actually get to know Gabrielle and Fenris. Fenris quickly becoming one of the greatest fake characters for me, by the way. But at the same time, due to the massive amount of action sequences, this book also felt predictable and repetitive at times. But I guess it all goes down to what you like about Throne of Glass series in the first place. If you enjoy the fantasy, quick plot development, and great battle scenes, then I'm sure you will find Empire of Storms to be thoroughly enjoyable to read. If you are like me and you prefer all the drama outside the battlefield, this book, while still very much enjoyable, might might not be your favorite one yet. One way or another, the ending of Empire of Storms makes this book and all of the books predating this one worth reading. On this note, we will proceed to the spoiler review, so if you haven't read Empire of Storms yet, now it's a great time for you to click off this video. I usually find it difficult to summarize these books as so many different plot lines are happening at the same time, yet Empire of Storms, when you really think about it, it's not that difficult to explain. Aelin and her court goes to Terrasen and gets denied the crown, Dorian gets attacked in Rifthold and saved by Manon and Rovan, Aelin and part of her court travels to Ilium where they get attacked by Andovir's overseer, they battle, then Aelin and the gang proceed to go to the Skull's Bay where they meet Dorian, Rovan, Gavriel and Fenris and get attacked by the Val, so they battle. Elite and Lorcan run into each other during Elite's escape from Morath, and shortly enough, they get attacked by Ilken, so they battle. Further down the road, they join a troop of street performers, and during their journey with them, they get attacked by Ilken demons again, so they battle. Meanwhile, Aelin and her buddies head to Ilvi, hoping to find the lock, which would help to seal in the word keys. They meet with Manon, who is still gravely injured after her battle with her grandmother. And on the way to Ilvi, most of our main characters are being attacked once more, 
so they battle. While Lorcan and the lead stop momentarily for supplies and get attacked by Vernon, and you guessed it, they battle. Finally, all of the characters we really care about reach Stone Marshes, and of course, they get attacked by Ilken and Valg again. So they battle again. They recuperate the Witch Mirror, and before they can leave the Stone Marshes, they get attacked by Maeve's Armada. So they battle. While reading this book, I honestly felt like the element of surprise just dissipated. All through the book, every time our beloved characters would change a location, they were met with a surprise attack. It was starting to feel so repetitive that to an extent it became funny. Well, of course they travel to a new town. Well, of course they were attacked. Well, of course they won with minimal injuries or losses. Instead of elevating the stakes and making me feel that nowhere is safe, it just made me feel, well, bored. Now don't get me wrong, the book contained a lot of amazing action scenes, such as Manon's fight with her grandmother, uh, Lysandra as a sea dragon, or Aelin combining her power with the powers of Rovan and Dorian and completely obliterating Valg. I absolutely loved reading these action-packed sequences, but there were so many of them that they became a bit predictable and at times they started to overshadow the character dynamics with one another. At one point, I just thought that nothing Nothing in this book could surprise me anymore. And then the ending happened. All right, but before we jump into the ending, let's discuss a little bit better the characters and the plot of the book. So the Empire of Storms includes more couples than any other previous Throne of Glass book. And that's not to say that the other books that didn't have a romance angle to them, nor it's to say that this book is very concentrated on the romance aspect. It's more like Sarah J Maas realized that soon enough she will have to wrap up the series and the main characters cannot be left single. Not that I'm complaining, as I absolutely adore these couples. First and foremost, we have Ayelin and Rovan, who are, in my eyes, in an ideal partnership. I'm sure I've said that before, but these two are such a perfect match that I struggle to name any other fantasy book couple in which the characters would be so perfectly paired. The love and respect and the understanding they share is off the charts. The fact that in the end of the book we got to know that they are actually mates or that they got secretly married didn't even really come as a surprise to me because of course there are mates. And of course they got married, it couldn't have been any other way. Overall, at this point, I would just read a book that is solely concentrated on these two living a happy life together, and I'm sure I would swoon all through it. Another not expected, but definitely appreciated pairing in this book happened between Elite and Lorcan. And I love the fact that despite the novel being so packed with events, the author still took the time necessary to build this tension, to allow them to get to know each other properly and slowly give in to these feelings they have. Now, I have never been much of a Lorcan fan, for obvious reasons, I guess, but I did enjoy his and Elite's chemistry as a couple. Elite softens him up, makes him feel more human. Of course, he only feels the need to protect her, which at the end of the day backfires and badly after Elite decides to cut him out of her life in the end of the book, but I still appreciated getting to know this different side of Lorcan. Reading about them was much more entertaining than I thought it will be. However, when it comes to Dorian and Manon, Sarah J Maas didn't bother to dedicate the same amount of time building their relationship as she did with Aelin and Rovan or Elite and Lorcan. Honestly, even after I'm done reading this book, I can't say that I know for sure how they feel about one another. I like their dynamic together for sure, but at this point their relationship feels solely physical. And while there's nothing wrong with that, I do hope that as the story progresses in the last books, we will get to see them defining whatever this is more clearly. As of now, I still love the fact that they have one another. As God knows, they both need someone at least to release this pent up stress with. Just in the last couple of books, both of their lives were turned completely upside down. Dorian learned about all the shitty things his father was involved in, just to see the woman he loved to be beheaded 
beheaded in front of him, then be possessed by Val, kill his own father, and then see his city being destroyed and overtaken by the enemy forces basically as soon as he himself became a king. And Manon wasn't having that great time lately either. Her whole understanding of life and her whole identity was ripped away from her. To put it simply, they both had a few very stressful months and I just want a happily ever after for both of them and whether they will find that happy ending with each other or with someone else, I guess only time will show. And lastly, when it comes to the romance in this book, we have Adian and Lysandra. And I just love Lysandra. She has such a no time for bullshit character. She is completely dedicated to their cause and she is blindly loyal to the people she cares about. And of course, she is a badass. She was already a badass as Ghost Leopard, but Lysandra as Sea Dragon was absolutely fascinating. Now, we did know all of these amazing qualities of hers before already, but Empire of Storms solidified her as one of my favorite characters. I just couldn't get enough of her. I can't say the same thing about Adian though. I really want to love him, I do, especially since I find his crush on Lissandra so cute, but his hard-headed tendencies and his speaking before thinking attitude more often than not rubs me the wrong way. Time and time again, he says something he ends up regretting in the long run. And while this is a very human quality to have, I find it so difficult to read him berating Aelin for not leading them the way he thinks she should or not collecting enough forces or in the end of the book cutting Lysandra out of his life because she followed the orders of her queen. In the end of the day, since all of our other fey male characters are much older and therefore much wiser, sometimes it is so easy to forget that Adrian is still in his mid-twenties. And while he does behave like an ass once in a while, I am still not losing hope of him getting his shit together and creating a beautiful life with Lysandra, because that woman deserves the very best in life. Lastly, let's take a moment and talk about the ultimate MVP of this book. Abacrox. By now, I have already lost count how many times Abacrox saved Manon's ass. Yet in this book alone, Abacrox went above and beyond for her. All of them, actually. Besides saving Manon again, he managed to somehow find Island ship and deliver Manon to them so they could heal her. And then once she'd hit the fan, he set out on a solo mission to fly and find and bring back the rest of the 13 to fight with them. And while some might argue that his incredible incredible tracking skills are a bit of a deus ex machina, I say that I don't care. Abacrox is the best and I love him. Now there's one thing in Empire of Storms that made me feel a little bit uneasy all through the book and that was Aelin herself. To be honest, for the majority of the book, she just felt lost to me. Now, don't get me wrong. I loved the scene where she put Darrow to his place, and I adored this whole sequence where she travels to Skull's Bay and toys with the pirate gang. The sassy island. Always three steps ahead island. The confident island that's my absolute favorite island. And of course, I understand that she's still human and she gets to have doubts and be unsure of things. But in this book, she just didn't really feel like her usual self. When reading Empire of Storms, I was already planning in my head how I will talk in this review about her being lost, about her feeling somewhat weaker than usual. But then the ending of the book happened and I realized that I just fell in the same trap that the characters of this book kept on falling into over and over again. I underestimated Aelin just because I didn't knew about the moves she was making behind the scenes. And oh my god, <laughs> the ending of this book. As soon as Aelin and Manon traveled through the witch mirror, everything just turned from bad to worse to heart-wrenchingly awful. The moment Elena started speaking about the price that needs to be paid in order to defeat Erevan, I instantly knew that this was going to be some sort of Harry Potter aka race to be sacrificed in the right moment level bullshit. And yet, I still wasn't ready for that revelation. Aileen just found herself, her mate, her friends and family, and, and now she's supposed to give that all up? And it's not only Aileen I was upset about, but Rovan too. How can we do this to Rovan? How can we take this life he would have had with Aileen away from him? And then it hit me. It's not going to be Aileen who will sacrifice herself. It's going to be Dorian. Now, this is not a spoiler because I have not read the last book yet, and I did try to avoid 
any spoilers whatsoever, but putting all of this pressure of sacrifice on Aya Lin while casually mentioning that Dorian also could technically be the one to save them all feels weirdly like a misdirect. Not that I want Dorian to die either. I adore Dorian, he's a little cupcake that needs to be protected at all costs. But as of now, I just don't see the series ending with both of them being alive and that just breaks my heart. And talking about my heart breaking, the last 50 pages. They were a nightmare to read. The whole scene of May with Aileen and others on the beach has to be the most emotionally charged moment in all five books. It was so infuriatingly perfect. Aileen's refusal to defend herself in order to save a lead, others' inability to help her, Rowan's raw agony when he realized that his new wife has been taken away from him. It was so perfect, and yet I think it will take me a long while before I will want to reread this scene again. It was just too painful to read. It truly broke my heart. And if the book would have ended here, this would have been a very dark story. Yet the book thankfully ended on a flicker of hope. We get to see the armies and the assassins and the old friends all gathering together for one goal, to help Aelin defeat Erevan. And we see just how many people Aelin has influenced in the last 10 years of her life, and that's beautiful. But that's just my opinion. What about yours?